Good morning, welcome. I am Jorti Lishi. And today I'm going to speak about uh, forensic experts' work, how how they can search for search uh, uh, among uh, the devices of uh, persons. Uh, I'm not uh, talking about hacking, uh, because in the Hungarian uh, uh, civil court there is no such crime as hacking. And uh, last year I mentioned that uh, if somebody wants to be a criminal, should read the criminal code at least. Uh, I'm I'm going to introduce some uh, legal gook at the beginning because certain words uh, need to be explained, uh, such as a suspect, uh, uh, defendant, uh, uh, sentenced person. Uh, a suspected person uh, is, uh, or a defendant is against whom a criminal procedure is going on. He might not be a, a, a false, falsifier of banknotes or um, uh, uh, some uh, uh, mis uh, wrongdoer uh, uh, accused of sexual misconduct and so on. Um, the main question is that in the field of IT security, who are the players uh, whom we should reckon with and who are the forensic experts? Uh, first of all, we have the user who is peaceful and he wants to use his computer for something and then there is uh, a, an evil attacker and devil and there are the defenders uh, um, who, the, these are the good guys who try to to preserve the sleep of the tranquil user. On the side of the defense, only preventive and corrective measures are taken to hinder access or to correct uh, uh, unlawful access. But uh, there, there is also a third player in the field, and he is the pathfinder. Uh, the, uh, the, the digital monitoring person, uh, the person who is responsible for logging and uh, searching in logs, uh, uh, which is uh, an important part of this battle. Uh, all these players have the life cycles, planning, uh, correction uh, cycles. Today I'm going to speak about the pathfinders. Uh, I'm going to speak from the point of view of the pathfinder. Well, how we can view the system from this angle. Computers, crime, criminal investigations uh, can come together uh, because computers can be the target of a criminal action. And uh, it can be a computer as a target, it can be um, a, an environment, implementation commitment environment, and uh, this is the wrongdoer's computer, or this may be the computer containing the whole system or a symbol. Uh, normally, somebody says 100 computers without software, and uh, normally what is the most frequent today is in my practice uh, the, uh, that the computer is the witness of the crime activity. What are, uh, so we are looking for digital traces. The, uh, that's the forensic expert is doing. Digital evidence objects, DO. And uh, uh, similarly to CSIO, uh, we try, try to find data as evidence uh, on the on the computer or on the CD of a person. It can be files, data structures, parts of files, uh, uh, different settings and register contents th uh, that uh, may contain relevant values from a criminal procedural law point. All the other traces data is uh, a value object that can be uh, repeated at several places and can be all, can have authenticity to be there and what is important uh, it is very difficult to distinguish the original one from the from its copy 
and counterfeit, to identify counterfeit uh, data is very difficult. Uh, the root of the problem is whenever we look, s look something f f look for something on a CD. Uh, in the case of Windows, we have uh, uh, 16 uh, gigabytes, number of files more than 80,000, number of folders or directories more than 18,000. And it's nothing else but the operating system. And it doesn't contain uh, the private files, music, video, uh, documents, pictures, and all the rest. Um, let alone uh, tools and softwares that one must use. So the problem starts here. So the forensic expert is looking for a needle in the haystack. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, investigated eight terabytes uh, uh, workers, uh, users' workstation. Eight terabytes is really a haystack. The other problem that I'd like to mention here uh, in the work of forensic expert is thoroughness. Uh, if we would like to check the Winchester of a person, it is very, very time consuming. We have to look for lots of things, and time is money, as you know. And in our small country, authorities don't like uh, people uh, tampering uh, about on a computer because it costs a lot of money. Uh, although the uh, early fee of a forensic expert is not really high, and uh, unlawfully very often we are not paid only if we have a lawyer supporting us. Uh, and uh, uh, very often uh, the question surfaces if uh, an evidence is against the law or is in accordance with the law. The other problem is that uh, if you are doing your work superficially, then the problem is that you will miss important data, some trif trifles which can really prove a guilt of an attacker. Uh, I, I cannot provide uh, the authorities with data which would really prove the uh, will serve as an evidence of guiltiness. On the other side, it is more important that we cannot prove innocence either, and there is a problem with the assumption of innocence. There are certain criminal cases in which uh, the Americans accuse something of pedophilia because he has pedophile pictures on the computer. Only the expert forget, forgot to see, to, to check those malicious programs that really uploaded uh, these uh, pornographic pictures. And the real user you uh, use the machine to store pedophile pictures, uh, which uh, which are very very kind to a wrongdoer, but uh, has nothing to do with the person whose, uh, whose computer it is stored. So forensic experts must really collect data to support guilt or innocence. And then here we have problem three. We have a normal file system. There are lots of deleted files damaged or partial files, uh, embedded, uh, hidden or deleted, uh, or uh, hid hidden or embedded or destroyed data on somebody's uh, Winchester. Uh, we can help the situation by uh, a publication in 2003. And this is a layer approach, uh, a stepwise, layer by layer approach for the processing of data. The other thing is on, uh, on identifying a peach or an elephant, uh, only you can have a small bite, but how can you tell if, if it was an elephant or a peach? And what are those uh, special fields that are suitable, uh, appliable to certain things, and where we should search? 
searching the physical layers. <laughs> My answer is a very definite, uh, which is neither yes nor no. Uh, we should find zeros and ones, bits, for signal. And uh, we, we should try to record these uh, zeros and ones uh, in an authentic way, uh, because it is an expectation that we should have an authentic copy of the data with which uh, we can prove that nobody tampered with it. Uh, at least a cash or a digital signature should be prepared, uh, not only about a hard disk, but also uh, data traffic on the network. At the level of media management layer, uh, we should check um, main data containers. For example, where are the partitions uh, or the slack, uh, the gaps between the partitions, the non-partitions part, and anomalies uh, of overlapping areas and partitions, allocation errors. Uh, this is uh, the management layer uh, of which we will speak more later on. Because, for example, uh, uh, this is the layer when we go back, when we when we really want to, want to gather evidence. The next layer is the presentation layer, when we try to identify well-known files, uh, metadata. Uh, uh, we try to filter the huge amount of files. There are QS databases, U files, Soroscope files uh, are. Uh, uh, are filled with S databases. We set aside non files with quick results, and then we, we put away on the other side those that will be the object of our further research. Unfortunately, such hash databases do not exist in Hungary, and unfortunately, neither in Europe do they exist. So uh, forensic experts working in the region really get must get hold of lots of uh, files, uh, many more than the American uh, investigators. Metadata should also be identified, textual data, uh, and also the useful uh, comments and data with which we can uh, uh, we, we can uh, really get hold of relevant data for the forensic expert. Here, in this layer, we can check if extensions um, uh, correspondent, correspond to encoding, the, the real content of the file type. If, a zip f if something which looks like a zip file, uh, then we should check if it's a real zip file. In my uh, uh, practice, MP3 files were not playable MP3s, but uh, at the court tire, uh, trial, everybody spoke about the violation of copyrights. Uh, and then uh, we have a popular SIG, uh, Logzi Loichi, and then he said that it is MP3 file. And uh, uh, the first and most uh, encoding, most used encoding technique uh, wasn't involved. And then uh, it wasn't a real MP3 file, although the court trial was about stealing MP3 files. And then we should look for the encryption of a certain file files if they are encrypted. Uh, at the beginning, I simplified uh, by saying that that at the beginning of the investigation, we, we do not use secret files or encrypted files because encryption uh, is very rarely used in most of our cases. Encryption is used for certain files of uh, certain directories. The next thing is the application layer that's closest to the human interface, which is about some intelligence. I'm looking for signs of intelligence in the FAS. It's not an IT-based task, because watching a video to see when they speak of people, times, and dates, or looking at a photo to establish whether a girl is a minor or not. And that's not a job for an IT forensic expert. It's forensic, but it's a different sort of expertise. And 
we've got to a point where we've found all the data that we could easily look at and view and check. So that's the quick wins, the quick and easy part. And now the challenge is, what do we do with the heap of data that we believe might be on the system? Because based on experience, we know that at the file level search, you won't find a downloaded temporary files. And then I will try to dig up the fragments of files from the bitstream. It's like um, the dumpster diving or a scrounging in the dustbin. I have lots of zeros and ones or hexa values. I'm looking in the bare bitstream for things I did not look using the normal search methods. Now, coming back to the point of which tier to look for them in. First of all, it's the media management layer. At least the bits and bytes in big heaps can be identified. If they are labeled in some way. And at the presentation layer, files embedded in other files can be found identified using this technique. Now, in order to understand the data um, chiseling, data carving, a simple approach to this is that we have a rectangular uh, file that has an array of data. It has a header which is predefined depending on the coding and there's a footer and there's an offset between the header and the physical beginning of the file and these are actually the values that give us some clue as to how to assemble file fragments or damaged data or deleted data. Now, these are the magic numbers. In relation to which we can check headers and footers, and they include hex numbers. So our search is actually in quest of these magic numbers. We need to, first of all, identify these. There's a great website where you will find lots of magic numbers to carve back um, far fragments. Many of you must be familiar, even bored by uh, JPEG files, and I'd like to demonstrate this using the uh, JPEG file format. Data carving example. I have not prepared a complete hex editor because um, I'm being somewhat nervous and embarrassed I may even get it wrong. So here's a, a simplified example. And with zero offset, FFD8 is the start of the JPEG file. So that's the probable starting point. And then you continue your quest from there. And then go look for the footer, which marks the end, FFD9, in the case of JPEG files. And if the two endpoints are identified, then all you need to do is export that bunch of data into a separate file. And if you add a JPEG extension to it, then you will find the pictures embedded or deleted or long lost files in the bitstream. I'll show you a few examples from my own practice on 
forgery, for instance. I found certain bits and pieces of information, not always as fragmented as you can see here. For instance, in the center, the 500 foreign bill shows you that uh, I could recover that without any loss in quality. Now, the key sources of JPEG files are digital cameras, scanners, internet and download sources. They include lots of pictorial information. And ThumbsDB is an interesting place to look in Windows, because even after deleting uh, the files, the icons are not deleted. So ThumbsDB can be retroactively be recovered to check whether there were certain images of the nature you are looking for. Well, apparently, um, data can be erased without a trace, but ThumbsDB is just one of many spectacular examples of how data can be dug up. I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's a somewhat simple approach. FFD8 to FFD9 are the two magic numbers for JPEG numbers. And if we dig deeper, um, the hex values get a bit more complex. And even deeper, we get a variable part, and then there is a fixed section as well, EXIF in hex, for instance. So these magic codes are not that easy. They're not that obvious, after all. And of course, the fewer the mistakes, the more precise the definition should be. When we delimit the beginning and end of file fragments. Now, what are the data carving tools? Well, from my business, my world, commercial forensics tools uh, leap to mind. They cost money. And I don't want to open up a can of worms talking about open source and closed source. But certainly, open source uh, applications reveal their uh, problems. And the commercial software, all we know about that software is the hype, the selling points, and the bugs advertised in the selling process. So all I can say is, in addition to commercial uh, tools, there's uh, plenty of free stuff as well to let you start on this journey. And you can also go to battle with any hex editor and look for data out there. What if things are not as simple as in the case of JPEG? Let's say a digital piece of evidence may continue further embedded digital evidences. What if there's no header, no footer? What if the file is fragmented? Because it's a property of certain file systems that you can't clearly say about consecutive uh, blocks after deletions and changes, whether consecutive blocks really belong together. Now let's look at the first option. What if I have a header with the embedded length of the file? So this somehow ties back to the solution to the first problem, because if the header includes the length of the file, all it takes is math and a bit of patience to identify the files. And also, as an alternative, there may be a header, and uh, we assign a ceiling, a max file size, to it. And then what we try and establish is if we can find a file which is not sensitive to certain starts of inappropriate 
uh, coding, MP3 and JPEG are two examples. So let's say the JPEG file is a bit longer than the actual the picture, then the viewer won't hang up and you can still view it. Well, in the pictures from my practice, you could see certain fragmental uh, parts. And MP3 coding is also such that longer files can be restored. And it will even tolerate garbage in the coding, and it could still be played back. Now, these ideas relate to the absence of nice headers and footers. I can't even assign a length. What I can do then is attempt to restore the fragment. In a hex editor, I have blocks that look much alike, and I pair them and say that they will be included in the same file. That's heuristic as an approach. And also, I may be hoping that uh, fragmentation was not um, excessive in a certain section, so all the consecutive uh, blocks must be parts of the same file. And the next thing is, you may check the characteristics and the entropy of certain file sections and blocks. And then you try to wear them together, and glue them together, and check if anything useful results from this process. Sometimes the file has a specific internal structure. So if you know that internal file structure, based on trial and error, you can piece together what the original file may have been, if you take the example of a database file. And also, there's semantic carving, which is about reading into the data, or viewing some of the data, that is. And if I see some Hungarian uh, text, and then it turns into English, and then into old Chinese, I may get the idea that these may be three different files. And then I'll try to piece together the Hungarian fragments, then the English, then the old Chinese, depending on what I see coming out of this. Or it, restoring a website it could also take place in a similar fashion, because consecutive uh, web blocks uh, and their data can be interpreted that way. Now the next thing is how do you validate? You could do that automatically to check the encoding, let's say, whether it corresponds to the specifics of the coding that I'm looking for. In certain cases, this is working. In some others, it's not working. A good heuristic results can be achieved by getting index uh, pictures of a heap of files that seems to have been recovered. And I rule out uh, what seems to be a mess and focus on the rest. Small video fragments, for instance, could also be monitored in a visual way and validated. Now, the next issue that occurs is in the case of embedded files, when one file is restored, it must be inserted amongst the files and checked for further embedded files. Because let's say the defendant embeds a picture in a Word document and then renames it TMP and then condenses it and renames uh, uh, the condensed version as well. And he will continue so long as he has patience and energy to spare. And retracing that trail is 
about uh, looking for what's embedded where and then checking for further embeddedness and so on. And the best tools I know, and that's the good thing, the best tools actually restore files and then recheck them for further embedded data. So this is an ongoing process. Overlapping content is the next thing. In these cases, we'd better get back to the second layer and then check for overlaps amongst the data. And whether we could recover data that uh, people tried to hide that way. And finally, what I can say is data carving is not only for crime fighters or it's not even purely the world of hackers, but on a daily basis, hard drives tend to crash. I'm sure you've all seen the smoke coming out of the box. And once the smoke emerges, it means it's no longer usable. So data carving techniques could offer a solution. But if the problem is not that grave, there are some sector problems which disable the operating system startup. These techniques could also come in handy. Or if someone inadvertently or by accident formats a drive and then starts overwriting the drive and it turns out that there was valuable information on that drive. Uh, you could use uh, file carving to carve back some of the data. So many different formats are supported. And a few useful links. The presentation will be mounted on the website at the end of the event. So you'll be able to check up on further information sources in the open source or a sense. And I do suggest you check out the source forge for different tools. They may not be called the tools for data carving, but they could be um, useful utilities for the restoration of data. Well, that's about all I wanted to say. Let me ask if you have any questions. Yes? Uh, the interpreter can't hear the question unless the speaker uses a microphone, so unfortunately I can't translate this. So, as I mentioned, when we fix uh, data, restore data, we should get a copy of the data or uh, we should um, protect the authenticity using some sort of hash solution. And the situation in, in Hungary is it's not the procedure but the expert who is authentic. So a forensic expert's work is authentic because he is deemed to be a reliable person under law. It's somewhat different from the Anglo-Saxon approach where the cleanness of the procedure is in the forefront and the human involved is of secondary importance. And of course the expert in principle must describe the procedures used and their precision and the data source must also be included, which enables people to go back historically and restore the content. Now again, uh, the speaker isn't using a microphone, sorry. Well, actually, uh, even Schneier said on encryption, I'd call him a blue Schneier because all we saw uh, was uh, the blue screen. So, if encryption is used well, there's no genuine arm against uh, encryption. Uh, there are bypass techniques, rather. So uh, currently, I believe, first of all, secret service or intelligence type devices could be used. People 
in black, wearing uh, black specs, declaring a document secret for 80 years. So that's the world of secret services. We can't know a lot about uh, what's going on in that world and uh, why they do that. Well, uh, for instance, using a microphone, you can crack a password because uh, the keyboard sounds are quite specific. And if I know the language, then based on the sounds of the keyboard, this applies to English as well, above 90% probability uh, relates to the sounds. But uh, the Trojan uh, horses and uh, backstroke uh, loggers and password stealers in the national security uh, field. This is all hearsay, an urban legend that is an intelligent guess of what might be going on. Please go ahead, we can't hear Is there any attempt at identifying stenography? If I understood it correctly, he is not using the microphone either. Here, can I, here I can speak, there I can see. The present stenography uses encryption methods. So, St steganographic uh, softwares are very rarely used without encryption. I mentioned entropy examination at the beginning, and then we, we might grow suspicious that something is happening behind it. But the steganography actually excludes its operation because uh, the encrypted material is a uh, kind of pseudo material. Uh, it is somewhere put into a picture, hidden in a picture, and this kind of steganography cannot be protected against. But if um, uh, non-encrypted data are hidden into files and we are looking for them, then uh, we can be successful. Forensic experts uh, revealed that steganographic tools were there on one of the data carriers of the suspected person. And when, when you know what kind of steganography is used, then it is much easier to look for anomalies and type of anomalies. Otherwise, we need real luck to find them. Thanks. Any other, anybody else? Again, we can't hear this. That the file not go. Secured file and secured delete, uh, secured wipe or secured delete type of deletion of a file and deletes the file itself. But otherwise, it leaves uh, traces behind. Very often, temporary files are not deleted with this method, and uh, data can be filed. Uh, uh, someplace else. Uh, so I am not finding the original source, uh, uh, primeval source, but some segments of the files uh, or remnants or fragments of the files as uh, some residue that uh, can be used for restoring the file. Again, the question is not heard. In real fact, it, it is not the owner that uh, who, who becomes suspicious um, uh, because of this data. Uh, an IT forensic expert uh, very rarely can identify evidences related to a person. Uh, we can identify evidence belonging to a certain user name. And uh, this is an absolutely other part of the investigation for the police to prove uh, that the user is identical to the person. Uh, uh, that the, the perpetrator is the same person who belongs to the same um, user name. 
I am Ilishi Jolt, and uh, if I find some kind of an interesting data on my notebook, which is exclusively used by uh, myself, well, I know, don't look for it uh, at my files, but then it is very difficult to say for me that those events that happened under the name of Illeshi, uh, I'm absolutely innocent about and I didn't commit them. In these certain cases, we should check the opportunity of remote uh, access uh, through which uh, these data are moved into pictures that are actually identified as evidence. If there is uh, false money, uh, for example, when a person uses the scanner and I find the if I find both sides of the of the banknote in together with the scanner identification in a in a file, but in the case of pedof pedophile pictures, we should always check if there is a malicious code on the on the machine because then these pedophile pictures uh, may be moved to this um, user computer and very often in Hungarian practice an IP uh, address is enough to identify a person. A real forensic expert can take this apart, this IP apart, but at, when a procedure is started against you, you should have a, a real lawyer to fight off these anomalies. If the charge is raised against you, then it's very difficult to sneak out of this very intricate, delicate situation in 90% um, of the of the charge, uh, uh, there is a direct uh, sentence connected to the 90 person, so the charge is raised. How can forensic experts be involved in this or something like this? Otherwise, I can't hear the rest of the questions. something about Hungarian police, but I can't really hear it. In my practice, it happened that uh, I, uh, the police brought me one brown computer, whatever it means. Uh, the practice is very uh, different. And then there are special groups of Hungarian police where there are real professionals handling uh, the cases. Uh, they can save everything on the crime scene. And the forensic expert who is not a policeman but a civilian receives a copy and works from the copy. But there are also uh, instances in my practice that, uh, that the representative of the authority switches on the computer and wants to find, uh, find something before the forensic experts. Uh, at a mobile telephone, he thinks he's capable of finding the PIN code in three trials. Sometimes it, it is successful, but behind this, uh, unfortunately, the education, IT education at the, uh, at the police academy is uh, insufficient, and uh, criminal technological atlases and manuals on the market, there are two types of evidence, remnant of, uh, remnant of material and some some prints, such as footprints, some blood, some urine, and um, and if an editor password is uh, just flying over a computer network, then uh, it will not be in neither of the evidence, ty evidence type. I was at the Pitch University, South Hungary, when I saw uh, the Department of uh, or the, 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 the Department of Crime and Technology uh, and the Matrix print printer there. Uh, uh, was taught to lawyers how printer works, how the needles of the printers work, 
and these lawyers um, uh, will be prosecutors, uh, they will raise charges, they will be uh, the judges deciding. So the level of the training uh, in the legal uh, uh, society is very low, the IT level is very low. Peach has uh, a, a university subject, legal informatic, and a parent who is a judge go, went uh, to the law school and said, why, uh, why such a technological uh, subject is taught to his five? He's going to be a real lawyer. And sometimes extremities are shown like all legal people uh, uh, can interpret digital signatures only in electronic form. If it is printed, it it is worth nothing. But if on a web, if there is a web, web crime, and I receive traces, uh, evidence, uh, then everything I receive is printed pages, prints of the web page. So it's very extreme. And forensic experts uh, are sometimes very well prepared and sometimes very ill prepared uh, because the training and further training on forensic expert uh, is conducted in the legal area. Uh, in relation to the legal basic training, but IT, IT further training is really missing. Sometimes it works at um, medical forensics, but in the, in the case of IT, it's very, very heavy-handed. Thank you. Uh, this is roughly the end of my presentation. Please contact me during the break with further questions. Um, I'm going to be here tomorrow during the breaks, uh, during the lunchtime. See you then.